<laughs> Gilbert Gottfried is with me now in studio. Hi, Gilbert. Oh, hello. Before we before we turned the microphones on, I said I told you how much I I love the documentary, and you said that's a real shock to me. Oh yeah, because this is this is a touching film. This is honest. Um, but like in our introduction, we hear these two sides of you: a very public side that we know from TV and film, and then and I know from from radio, and one that um, I've never heard before. What what is it like to let your guard down, reveal that other side? Ah, horrible. <laughs> uh, it was <laughs> horrible. Yeah, yeah. That's a, in a word. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Why is it so horrible? Uh, well, it, it's funny. I've seen the film like three times now, and each time it's what I envision hell to be like. <laughs> I, I think when you die, they probably sit you down in a chair or a burning <laughs> rock or something, you know, and uh, they have a giant screen there, and you're forced to watch your life yeah. on there. <laughs> you're yeah. forced, to watch, forced to watch these private moments the, that no one ever sees. Oh, yes. So yes. why – why? because this was the question I had during the whole thing. It was like, why, why did he agree to do this? Uh, co co basically because I'm an idiot and I'm <laughs> too much of a wimp to tell somebody no. But really, did someone did someone approach you and say – Yeah, it was uh, – the uh, filmmaker Neil Berkeley, um, he he had just finished the film, and he was talking to this woman, who he said to her, uh, you know, and she asked him what, you know, what are you going to do now? And he goes, well, I always wanted to make a film about Gilbert Gottfried, and uh, she. She froze, and it turns out she's a friend of my wife's. Oh, right. And she goes, I, I know them, and they live two blocks from here. And then he called, and he came over, and then he invited me to lunch. And it's like if if Osama bin Laden invites me to lunch, I'll go. Yeah. If, it's, if they're paying, yeah. I, you know. <laughs> So I can't like Adolf Eichmann. Oh, what, 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 I, what I can't get over is is what is that? Just what is that like being in a cab and having a camera next to you? Being in on the bus and you have a camera next to you. Oh, horrible! Uh, and because he 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 came there and then he kept following me after that, and and it's like I would wake up in the morning and he'd be there. I'd be coming out my bathrobe and he'd be there, and I and I dreaded seeing him every. <laughs> I still, when I see him now, perfectly nice guy, but I, I cringe. You I never, go, oh, he, there he is again. He might have a camera in his hat or something like yes, that. Yeah. yeah. Might be doing the sequel. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is a weird thing to have a camera follow you like that. Yeah, I can't imagine. That's why I'm on the radio. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no one and, has to see me. And they, they even have a scene that I think by law, any uh, documentary – or reality show must have a scene in a car because <laughs> that shows movement. Yeah, transit. Yeah, I yeah, understand. yeah. yeah. It's, they're not really going anywhere. You just, as an audience, you you assume, well, he was talking about his childhood, so maybe they're driving <laughs> to his old home. Or Isn't that like, is it Midnight Cowboy? There's like, you know, the, the, there's that scene where he's driving. There needs to be a driving contemplative scene where you're looking out the window and it's oh, raining. Oh, yes. In every single movie. Oh, uh, yes. But, but there, there's, also the, there's also a lot there about your family life. Like, I think that a lot of people, when they have kids, they start to, th you know, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to have kids. And then one day they wake up and they have children and they think, how am I in any way responsible enough to take care of these children? Or oh, yeah. how did I in any way end up with these children? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's like I can't take care of myself now. Yeah. So uh, uh, <laughs> the idea of taking care of children. I loved watching the um, the comedians in the documentary come out and talk about you. Artie Lang uh, and, and and Artie Lang had a great line where he was talking about seriously. Gilbert got a Gilbert got a wife. What's wrong with me? What, what, what? <laughs> uh, Artie Lang and Susie Essman say they were so surprised that you met anyone, especially someone as patient as Dara, Dara, your wife, who's, who's just across the glass from us right now. So why do you think, Artie and Susan, why do you think these people who know you so well were so surprised that you, that you found a wife, that you found someone to love you? Yeah, well, it, it, it's all like part of my life. It's like uh, uh, I had enough trouble trying to go on a date with a girl, <laughs> let alone married. And... Um, 
yeah, it, it just seemed like that. That's normalcy. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, that's not something I specialize in. That must be another part of the chambers of hell, watching your friends talk about you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just want people to talk about me in a very prepared way that was written for them. <laughs> and like, I, like I've said before, I, I'm okay watching myself in a movie or TV show as Joe the Plumber. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's fine. Uh, but me as myself is a whole other story. Why do you think you fight it so hard? Uh, I Well, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, to the average person, they hear themselves in a recorder. Yeah. And they hear their voice and they go, oh, no, I sound that way. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, th- I think it's that to an extreme yeah. with me. Yeah. I mean, at one point, in the, your, your two kids are a part of this as well. And, and I love this scene. The, your, your younger kid, Max, is asked... Is your dad funny? And he has this moment where he stares yeah. at the camera for about good timing, by the way. Good yeah. comic yeah. Oh, timing. Yes. About 17 seconds, he's just staring <laughs> at the camera. <laughs> and then he goes, Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Were you surprised to hear that? Uh, no, nothing surprises me, especially with Max. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember one time. Uh, the teacher, he was going to preschool, and so he was really little, and we met with the teacher, and the teacher said, well, he doesn't pay attention in class, and he's always trying to be funny. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, I'll really have to reprimand him on that. (laughs) Uh, I don't know. I don't know where he gets that from. (laughs) And, and one time she asked him, she said, uh... Uh, are you, how did you learn how to be funny? And he goes, from my daddy. And she goes, oh, is your daddy funny? And he goes, he's funny at home, not at work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the highest, that's the highest compliment. That's yes, great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what does he do for a living? Don't worry about it. Don't yeah, worry yeah, about yeah. it. Yeah, don't ask. Yeah, don't ask. <laughs> You describe your relationship with your daughter as like when Frankenstein meets a little girl and she's throwing him daisies. And, and tell me about that. Frankenstein comes up throughout the film. Tell me about that scene and why you relate to it so much. Um, well, it's like there's there's that scene in Frankenstein where a little girl's throwing daisies into the lake and he comes along and it's like, you know, and, um, and then they start you know, playing together. He's not quite sure what it is, but he knows it's some sort of a game. And then he winds up, they're at a daisies, and he winds up picking her up and throwing her into the lake. Right. right. You know, innocently. Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. And uh, so I feel that way, like, you know, someone who doesn't understand the world, let alone uh, their own little kid. Mm-hmm. Does that make it hard? Does that make it hard to be a parent? Uh, at times, other times it's it's nice, and yeah. other times I go, "What am I?" There, there's a, a scene in the movie that's true. It looks like it was prepared, but it wasn't. I was uh, on the couch with her. I'm supposed to be watching her, yeah. And I think I either fell asleep or uh, whatever. I and and my wife started filming it and said, "Uh." Have you been watching Lily? And I go, uh, yeah, yeah, I was watching. <laughs> and she goes, uh, look at her. And uh, Lily had picked up a pen and drawn scribble lines all over her whole body. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I love that because she's she's sitting right on top of you. She could not be any closer to you yes. while she's doing it. <laughs> so it shows how aware. In fact, one time when she was first born. I was walking down the street, and uh, my phone rang, and it was my wife going, uh, uh, "Oh, where are you? Where are you now?" And I said, oh, "I'm picking up whatever at the store." And she said, "And uh, where's Lily?" And I went, "Oh, bleep." <laughs> um, Thanks for public radio, by the yes, way. That's nice yes. of you. I appreciate that. That's kind of you. You don't know how hard it is for me to. I know. I have it. some yes. idea. That's yeah. great. Thank you yeah. very much. Uh, and and I and I started running back home. I had left her there by herself. 
mm-hmm. because I wasn't yet uh, <laughs> under the understanding that you know you shouldn't leave an infant. Yeah, right. Uh, right. By themselves. Right. These are these are things you pick up over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it was like I was so used to being able to just get up and you know buy a container of milk by myself. But also, like, if that's the way... If, by the way, if you're just tuning in, if you couldn't tell, I'm just speaking with Gilbert Gottfried about his new documentary, Gilbert. But, you know, what you also get from this documentary is not just a glimpse into your family life. You also get to see what it's actually like for a working comedian. And you see Artie Lang at one point say, yeah, it's really glamorous. I get to go to San Antonio by myself, stay in a hotel room, and then go home. And we, and we see how kind of unglamorous it really is. And I know from just from, from being on the road myself playing music... I related to one particular moment, and I was hoping you could tell me more about it, which is when you're backstage, um, you're about to go on stage, and all you want is for the manager, all you want is for the booker to come in and say, hey, the show's canceled. Yes. Yeah. Tell me, yeah. About, tell me I, about that. I always, uh, my, my dream, my fantasy is right before I go on, right as they're introducing me, I'm thinking this, like that the manager will come back and say, oh, there was a fire or a flood. The show's been canceled. Yeah. Here's your check. You could uh, take a flight home now. Yeah. It's yeah. 12 at night. I know what yeah. you mean. I've, I've, I have felt that way. Like, I'm happy to be yeah. I, I love what I do. Yes. Happy to be there. I would love it. I would love to not do it. Yes. Yeah. E- exactly. It's it's one of those things. It's like, I, I just, I, I know I, I have specific times in my head where, uh, I've been backstage, and I thought there were two shows that night mm-hmm. that I had to do. And the, the manager will say, oh, no, t- tonight this is just one show. Mm-hmm. And I think, I don't have a second show to do? Yeah. And it's like this <laughs> tremendous weight yeah. is lifted off me. So, well, that's what Larry David says about uh, the idea of there's no greater feeling than if someone cancels on you. Yes. Like you, you, you canceling on someone doesn't feel as good, but if someone says you don't have to come, I can't make it. It's the greatest feeling in oh, the entire yes. world. Oh yes. Yeah, it is amazing. I, I, it's it's and and to to give you an example of an extreme, on this, one time I was booked in Hawaii. Now someone who's vaguely normal would go, "Oh, I'm booked in Hawaii. This is great." Yeah. And then I found out, uh, you know. Whatever, you know, something on their side, they switched clubs or it was a club and a hotel and the hotel changed hands or whatever. And but at any rate, the show was canceled. Mm-hmm. And they said, oh, uh, this, the, the, your Hawaii gig was canceled. And I was like, oh, God, I was in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> you, you didn't have to go lie in the sand. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have to lie in the sand and and watch Girls uh, sunbathing topless. No, right? the, 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 there's, there's a moment, um, though, that I, I wondered if it was hard for you to relive in making this documentary because there's there's the part about letting people in, but there's also the part about, about reliving some of the, our harder stuff. And some of the documentary deals with the controversial tweets you put out around the Japanese tsunami um, uh, and which ended up you know costing you your gig as, as the spokes duck of Aflac. You know, and that's obviously something you've dealt with, something you've put behind you. Was it hard to to revisit that for the documentary? Oh, one one of many uh, scenes in the documentary. Yeah, uh, that's why I call it one of those hell things. Yeah, because you're reliving all that, and that was like you know, uh, I I remember when that happened. First of all, I found out about it on the internet, yeah. which is apropos, and. I, it was like I was being treated like like some major war criminal that mm-hmm. they caught. It was like I would look out my window and they'd be there. They'd be – I lived in an apartment building. They'd be there. Like an, some would wait in a car. Some would hide in oh, doorways. Okay. And I would come out or come back home and they'd surround me. And I – the the funny thing about it is one tweet I got, and I thought it really summed it up perfectly. He said, Aflac fires Gilbert Gottfried after discovering he's a comedian. Right, right. And because it was like, this is something I do. I, I, I compared it to like, 
if every morning you wake up and have a bowl of cornflakes, mm-hmm. and then one day you have a bowl of cornflakes and all hell breaks loose. But did did, did going through the I know there's there's scenes where you take out the tweets and you start talking about it again. This is years and years later. Did that did that make you have any different feelings on it than perhaps you had in the past? Uh not really. No. I don't know. I I just kind of think, you know, I I'm upset about you know losing work. I'm upset about the press I was getting, and um, but I thought this is what I do. This is and and I think the funny thing about it, and and somebody mentions it uh, in the movie, is. Uh, that that's what draws audiences to me. What do you mean? Yeah, it, well, it's kind of one of these things. Like, I it, it, it was funny. It was like uh, when Michael Richards got in trouble yeah. for using the N word. Yeah, and that's another thing that makes me laugh that mm-hmm. you can say the N word, the F word, mm-hmm. and we all know what those words are. But if you put an initial there, that means it doesn't exist or something. Uh, and he got in trouble and uh, and then the the club owner there came out and said he's got this new rule that anyone who uses that word is going to be fined. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I thought, that, you know, you get on an, uh, a roller coaster mm-hmm. to to think you're gonna die. Mm-hmm. And you go into a scary movie to to think your life is in danger too, mm-hmm. and um, so you you wouldn't get on a roller coaster that says to you this roller coaster goes very slow, and there are no sudden drops or you won't be spinning upside down. It's very calm, and no, you go in there for that. So you you felt being like like you said, Affleck should have known the kind of yeah. comic you were when they, yeah. when they when when they got into working with you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, right. oh, yeah, okay. And and I kind of felt like you know when it happened, they fired me. They soaked it for all the press they could get out of it, and then hired a guy to imitate my voice for less money thus bringing closure to a horrible tragedy. Until you have to review it in a documentary yes. about your own life. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Listen, I, I want to thank you so much for coming in. Um, um, you talk a lot about how your life is like the twilight zone, like, like a life you don't recognize. We only got like 30 seconds left, but is your life getting any less twilight zone Is it getting any more recognizable, any easier? Uh, no, I, I, I still wake up, and I'm, I'm expecting someone to run out and go... Uh, that book to serve man. It's a cookbook. <laughs> <laughs>